Thanks for watching one of our messages today. My name is Caleb Combs and I'm the gathering pastor here at the river and we would love to connect with you. An easy way to do that is text River Connect to 97000 or you can visit our website, theriverchurch.cc for more information. If you'd like to financially contribute and give to the River Church, you can text an amount to 84321 or again, visit our website and click the giving tab. We hope you enjoy the message today. Did I hit the right button? Good. Good morning. Man, what an amazing time of worship this morning. I just appreciate Andrew uh, just leading us in worship and, and listening and pointing our hearts towards God. Uh, if you've been with us for the last couple weeks or if you're new, I just want to let you know we're, we're working through a series called Countdown to the Cross. And really we're just walking through uh, the life of Jesus the last week before the cross. And so we're going to kind of walk through. We've been last couple weeks. Uh, we started with the triumphal entry where Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem as a king. The people shouting his name, Hosanna, the son of David, the king of Israel. And Jesus walked in to Jerusalem on a donkey as a king of peace. And last week, John Rigg did an excellent job as we walked through the cleansing of the temple where Jesus went into the temple and removed the money changers and those who were there for self-gain, opening, in essence, the temple to the people who needed Jesus, right? One of the things we walked through our growth community this last week is reading the following text that after Jesus cleansed the temple, the blind and the lame were able to walk into the temple and they were healed. And the little children that were there, again, they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, giving Jesus, this title of kingship. So we've kind of walked through what would be a very public display of the person of Jesus. And one of the things that I, I want you to grasp is this is not just Jesus strolling through an average city, uh, maybe just the routine time of year or time of week. This is a, a very large time where, where all the regions of Israel, in essence, came and were were focused solely on Jerusalem. There were millions of people. You see, this is the, the feast of Passover is taking place in Jerusalem. And this is a week-long celebration, and so people from all parts of Israel would have come. You see, this, this tradition started way back in the day when Israel was in bondage under Egypt. And as they, they left, the feast of Passover takes place uh, Moses instructs the Israelites, as the death angel comes, the way to avoid the death angel was to take an innocent lamb, a spotless lamb, and to, to take the blood of that lamb and put it across their door, doorpost. And as the angel came through uh, the evening time or the night time in Egypt, if that blood was there, it would pass over. That's where we get the name Passover. And so for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, Moses had instructed the Israelites to observe this feast. It was uh, instituted as a, a commandment of God for them to observe this feast. And so here in Jerusalem, at this time, all of Israel is converging to Jerusalem to see and to participate in this feast of Passover. Passover. And it's really ironic to me if you really, we know now looking back to this, that here the very son of God, the, the perfect spotless lamb of God was walking amongst the people during this time that they were celebrating this freedom from bondage. And here is Jesus. Even John the baptizer called him, behold, the lamb of God. Right? So there's this picture of things that are happening in Israel that are both physical part of their tradition, and also very, very spiritual in nature. And so today we're going to be in John chapter 13. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. We're going to, we're going to change a little bit from the public eye, so to speak, to a very intimate and private conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. One of the things I want you to understand is as Jesus is partaking in the, the, the Passover here, one of the things that's really important to understand is that Jesus has maybe 12 to 18 hours left 
We know this looking back, so this is a very intimate time that Jesus has with his disciples. So let's go to John 13, and we will read through that. John 13, well, we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 20. It says this, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Some, some of your translations may say, You have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. And while he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. Speaking of Judas there. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Let's pray, and then we'll kind of walk through this text. Heavenly Father, man, thank you for your word, first and foremost, that we have something to go to and look to, to, to gain understanding and knowledge of who you are and what you would have us learn. Lord, be with us as we walk through this text. Help it to be clear, the message that is there. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So as I was reading this text, one of the very first words that stuck out to me was the word no. If you were paying attention, you'll see this word show up four specific times in the text that we read. And the word no means that, I looked it up in the, the Greek, it, it has to do with having a cognitive awareness of a specific fact or a specific information. And so... While the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet is a very, maybe if you've been to church, you've heard this before. Uh, maybe you've never heard it and you're like, man, this is really weird, <laughs> right? Uh, but I want to walk through this text and just look at the word no. Because I think it's going to lay a framework for us to help us see what Jesus knew and understanding that this is in the last moments Jesus has with his disciples, what he was trying to teach his disciples. We see the word no show up in the very first verse of the text. It says, when Jesus knew, he had this cognitive awareness, he knew a specific fact. And the fact was that his hour had come to depart out of the world to go to the Father. He knew this. He knew that his hour was 
was short-lived, that it was coming to an end. He knew that he was going to depart from the world. And I think that says a lot about what Jesus, and, and I'm not trying to pretend to be God. I want to put my mind in how, what would Jesus have been going through? Man, my time is limited. I have a little bit of time left with my brothers, my friends, my disciples. What's the most important thing I can reiterate to these, to these guys? And so here, Jesus, knowing that his time is limited, I love that it says this in here, knowing that he's about to leave this world, he says, having loved his own who were in the world. You see, Jesus knew that he loved his own. In fact, the text says there, even to the very end. He knew that his love would endure what he was about to walk through in the cross. It wasn't a guessing game for him. He wasn't like, oh, man, I really like these guys. Hopefully this works out. He knew. He knew what he was signing up for. He knew what he was about to endure. And he knew that his love would endure to the end. The next place you see this word no is in verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand. See, Jesus knew that he had victory. God the Father gave him all things into his hand. He had all authority. We saw this as he, as he entered in the public eye, the triumphal entry, the authority to go into the temple and remove the money changers and make it a place where those who were broken and hurting could come in and be healed. All authority, all things were given to him. Jesus knew this. I love that the, the Apostle John continues and he says this, and he says and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Again, I want, that, that's a very powerful phrase, and I'm glad it's written in there prior to the cross. I want you to think about that. Jesus knew where he was going. He knew that he would have victory over the cross and death and sin. He knew it. He knew he was going back to God. Jesus. You know, if you watch Hollywood movies every now and then, the hero, right, he, he, you see the scene play out. It's by the skim of their teeth that they make through a certain uh, horrible event and they, they survive or, or they, they just barely make it through and the, the desire of the outcome happens. This, this part of Hollywood, they produce it. It's kind of to keep you on the edge of your feet. Man, is he going to make it? Is he not going to make it? That's not the way with Jesus. Jesus knew without a shadow of a doubt, that he would overcome sin and death, and that he would return back to his Father. I love that that's recorded for us before Jesus goes to the cross. You see, Jesus wasn't playing a guessing game. He wasn't playing a game where, where man, I hope as I go through this struggle of the cross that, man, it comes to some good. He knew it. Clearly tells us here in John 13, he knew he had the cognitive awareness of the fact that he would be with his father. It's amazing to see that. And as the Apostle John goes through, he, he inserts this, this little snippet in this conversation that he and Peter have. And at first glance, if you read that, you might go, man, Peter is a very foolish man. Why is, why is he refusing Jesus? Right? He, he says to Jesus as Jesus comes in, I want to try to create the scenario and i got to understand, us looking back to the cross, looking back to the situation, we have a lot more information than they did, right? We know the outcome of what happens. But here's Peter. He's just witnessed the, the people, his fellow brothers and the Israelites, proclaiming that Jesus is the king of Israel. He's watched Jesus exercise his authority in the temple. And here in this private room, in this intimate conversation that Jesus is having with his 12 disciples, Jesus chooses to wash their feet. And Peter's like, whoa, dude, you got the roles mixed up here, <laughs> right? I mean, you can, you can initially see, see Peter and be like, man, I kind of understand where Peter's coming from. Here's the king. Why is the king washing my feet? Shouldn't I be washing his feet? And, you know, one of the things that as I try to connect these thoughts of what Jesus knew, I hope you get this. When, when Jesus says, you have no part with me, he's not talking about salvation. 
You see, what he's talking about there when he, when he approaches this conversation with Peter, everything that we see laid out in Scripture here is that Jesus loved his disciples. And the most important thing he was trying to teach them was the love that he had for them. And here is Peter refusing the love of Jesus. No, you're not going to wash my feet. You will never wash my feet. Refusing the love of Jesus. And Jesus says, listen, if you're not going to receive my love, you're not going to be a part of me. You're not going to. And we see this laid out actually in the same text. If you go down towards the bottom where he says uh, to his disciples, he says this. Uh, let's see, I think it's in verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord and you are right. Verse 14, I'm sorry. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You know it's not a salvific conversation because here Jesus is telling his disciples to go do the very same thing he has done. Go show the love of, that I have for you to one another. And so here Peter, as he rejects, you know, it's easy. And I, I initially, I got to be honest, at the very beginning of the week as I was walking through this, I was like, man, Peter, you're so foolish. Why don't you get it? And then towards the end of the week, the Lord kind of opened it up for me in my own mind. And he says, you know, that's a very applicable thing for us today. How often do we reject the love of Jesus? I've had the privilege of being able to go into prisons in previous years. And, you know, one of the things when you walk into prisons uh, that, that you don't, there's, a, there's several hurdles. But one of the hurdles you don't have to overcome is this idea that, uh, they're, they're where they should be. You, you don't walk into a prison and an inmate and you hardly ever hear, I've never heard actually, an inmate saying, hey man, this is exactly where I, I plan to be. This is, my life's good. I got everything covered. Me and God were great. I mean, not to say that they don't have a great relationship with God, but they, they're, there's no hurdle of, hey, you're broken. You're not where you should be. And inmates get that. It's usually the people outside of the walls that figure they have everything covered and they're all good. The hurdle that the inmates have is this very thing that Peter struggled with. I'm not good enough. I can't receive. No, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. I can't receive your love. A lot of guys struggle with that. And maybe you're in here today and you might feel the same way. If God only knew what I had done. If God only understood where my heart was, it's, it's covered in darkness and sadness or, or evil thoughts. There's no way a God or Jesus would love me enough to wash my feet. I love that the, the Apostle John puts this in here because it lays out very clearly stuff that's applicable for us as in today. Recognizing that Jesus is offering his love to each and every one of us. Whether we accept it or not is our decision. And here we see, of course, Paul or Peter's response. Dude, don't just wash my feet, wash my hands and my head. <laughs> right? He's like, man, I want to make sure I get all the love you have for me. I love that Peter is so emphatic about receiving the love of Jesus. The third thing we see here in verse 11 is that Jesus knew who was going to betray him. Now, initially, this, this seems, yeah, of course he did. You know, if you read some of the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, he goes through. Uh, and the betrayal is a big part of the conversation, and we'll dive into that later in the series. But here, Jesus, Jesus is recorded as knowing who would betray him. Again, this goes back to the love of Jesus. I love that Jesus, knowing who his betrayer was, still washed Judas' feet. That, that to me is amazing. It's contrary to the, to, to the human condition, right? Like if you know someone's going to stab you in the back, the last thing you're going to do, show them that you care for them and that you love them. That's the last thing you're going to do. <laughs> Here Jesus is being recorded as knowing who his betrayer is, and yet he chooses to show his love for even his enemy. Judas and chooses to wash his feet. You know, if you think for a minute that you're not like Judas in some point in time in your life, 
There's passages in Romans that talk about while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8, it says, but God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners. See, the love of God is always portrayed to us. And there was a moment in my life where I would have be, be considered a Judas, one who, who denied God, who betrayed God, who rejected God. I am so thankful, so thankful that the Lord didn't quit on me. Didn't, didn't quit showing his love to me. It is because of his love that I am here even today. It's amazing to me to see what we know Jesus knew in these final moments of his life. And I love that in those final moments, and we're going to walk through several other things in the coming weeks, but in this particular, the very first thing we see Jesus teaching his disciples, knowing his time is limited, is that he wants his disciples to grasp and fully understand his love that he has for them. In fact, you see Jesus say several times, even to Peter, he says, you don't understand what I'm doing right now, but you will, you'll get it. At the end of washing their feet, he says, do you understand what I have done? Do you get it? And even at the end there, he says, uh, that, we, that part we read, he says, now before it takes place, this is towards the end of the uh, verse 19, I'm telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. And if we know the narrative of the cross and what happens after, we know Peter denied Jesus. We know Thomas struggled to believe in Jesus. And so this doubt that may have existed in their hearts, in their minds, Jesus is preparing them and showing them, listen, the thing that's going to overcome that doubt is that you recognize that I have an an enormous amount of love for you. I love that this is how it's portrayed for us to see. One of the last things that we see, the last, if you will, knowing. Jesus, Jesus kind of flips the tables, if you will. There's several, three things that were recorded. We knew, Jesus knew that his time was short. He knew that he would have victory. He knew his betrayer. And then at the end of there, in this text, we, we see Jesus asking this question, do you know what I have done? And he gives a call to the believers, his disciples, that he, he references himself as teacher and Lord. And if I, your teacher and Lord, am willing to show this love to you, in other words, he says, you ought to show it to one another. And then you see in verse 17, if you know these things... Blessed are you if you do them. You see, Jesus is he's a great speaker. He, he calls to action. He gives us this information of what we know or what we understand, or what we know he knew. And then he turns around and he asks, do you know? Do you understand who I am and what I'm doing here for you? And this call to action, if you know this, if you know this, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are you if you do them. He flips it back to his disciples to help them understand what he's trying to teach them. The love of Jesus. The amazing, powerful love of Jesus. As he flips this back to the the believers, I think it's a very applicable um, It's just applicable to us, to flip it back on us. Do we know? Do we know Jesus? Do we know Jesus, his love, his amazing kindness, the fact that while we were still enemies with him, he chose to die for us. He chose to show us that he cared for us and loved us. Do we know that? Have we received that love? Or are we like Peter where we kind of take a step back for a moment? No, God, I'm I'm too... You're way too much for me, man. The the love is too much. I can't handle it. You'll never wash my feet, Lord. Or are we willing to submit? I mean, just imagine that scenario, even just in that moment. I don't really like people to see my feet. (laughs) Here, Peter, for whatever, maybe they had sandals on or whatever, but 
to have somebody else touch my feet is an awkward thing for me. I can't imagine it was unusual for even them to go through it. And here he is. Peter is, in essence, humbling himself to allow Jesus, the king of Israel, the Lord. And they have a, a, an understanding of who Jesus is. I mean, at this point, they've seen Jesus turn water to wine. They've seen Jesus feed thousands of people with a little amount of food. In fact, just prior to the entry, the triumphal entry, Jesus healed Lazarus, brought him from dead to life. Like, they're, they're talking to this amazing person, and they've seen him do amazing miracles. And then here they are, humbling themselves before this awesome person, letting them wash, letting Jesus wash their feet. So as we end today and as we conclude, I just, I'm just going to try to summarize what we see in this text, what we know in this text. We know for a fact that Jesus knew his time was limited. We know that. And Jesus knew that his time was limited. And the thing that he most desperately wanted his disciples to understand was his love for them, even to the end. He wanted us to know that too. That even to the end, his love would prevail, would be stronger than the Roman soldiers who whipped him, would be stronger than the ridicule and the mockery of what would take place in the trials. He knew that his love was stronger than the cross, the death of the cross. He knew it was stronger, the love of Jesus. And so the application for that, if you're a believer here today, do you know that love? And if you know that love, do you have this sense of urgency like Jesus did to share that love with other people? Is there, a, is there a, an urgency in your own life to share the love of Jesus to those in your family that may not know the Lord, your neighborhood, the place where you work, the community in which you live in? Is there an urgency for you to share this love? Jesus had an urgency to share the love that he had for his disciples. Do we walk with that understanding and knowledge? Or are we unaware of the time that is at hand? Do we know that Jesus is victory? Do we know that Jesus overcame sin and death? Do we know that? Maybe you're here today and you're struggling with the sin. It's just been the same sin that keeps knocking on the door try to overcome it and then it's back at the door again or maybe you've never even called out to Jesus to help you through those sins do you know today that Jesus is victory he's victorious he overcame sin he overcame death and that is who we are calling our Lord and our Savior our teacher and our Lord as he says here do we know these things Lastly, man, I just want to challenge you, if you're watching online or maybe you're here today and you really have never confessed with your mouth who Jesus is. Maybe you're in that state where you reject Jesus or you would deny Jesus. Man, can I just call out to you and ask you and plead with you to recognize the love of Jesus? I, as I was working through this, I, I imagined, I wondered Man, what would Judas say if he had the opportunity to come before us and explain to us the regret to not call on and not receive the love of Jesus? What would he tell us? What would he teach us? Would he, would he tell us that the call was right there? He saw Jesus washing his feet. And can you imagine being the one who rejects Jesus betrays Jesus and here the love of Jesus is right there he's washing his feet he's expressing the greatest humility to Judas and yet Judas chooses to deny him and reject him Romans 10 9 says because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved that's a promise 
That's what it takes. It's a confession of repentance. It's, it's like Peter when he humbled himself to allow Jesus to wash his feet and receive the love of Jesus. It's that confession. It's also the believing in our hearts. We know who Jesus is. And if we know, just like Jesus says in this text, he asks us to do. I want to read this just because I think it's, it's applicable and it's, it's very powerful. Further down, I didn't ask the tech people, so you won't see it up there, so I'm just going to read it. In John 13 and verse 34, it says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. That is, if you have love for one another. If you're familiar with the two greatest commandments during family, uh, the family series we did a couple months ago, or last month, we walked through a little bit of the, the two greatest commandments. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And loving your neighbor as yourself. Here, Jesus elevates that commandment one step further. He goes, don't just love your neighbor as yourself, because I think Jesus knew that some of us struggle to even love ourselves the way we ought to. Jesus says, don't love your neighbor as yourself, because some of you struggle in showing how to love someone. But he says, love your neighbor as I love you. He elevates the commandment just enough to tell us, love your neighbor the way God loves you. It's not, it's not a mistake that he elevates that commandment. Some of us struggle receiving the love. Some of us struggle relying on the love of Jesus. I just want to give you encouragement as believers today is as good a day as any to call out to Jesus. Ask for his love. Receive his love. If you've never done that, whether you're watching online or this is, I mean, you could be in church your whole life and have never called out. Peter was with Jesus the whole time. The whole time. He saw all the miracles. You could be in church your whole life and have never called out to Jesus and received his love. Let today be that day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you have shown us in this text. Thank you for, honestly, thank you for just loving me as a person. Lord, it's not always easy. I know it's not always easy loving me. And it's difficult. And you probably shake your head at me more often than not. But you still choose to love me, even in my brokenness. Lord, we love you for all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name.